Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Evolve Youth's first e-learning webinar. Uh, my name is Sofia Tevez. I am co-chair of Evolve Youth's Task Force 3. Uh, could you please confirm if you can hear me and see me um, well, please? Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome to our first uh, webinar. Uh, called Where There Is No Training, the Role of Professional Training in the Evaluation Profession. Our speaker today is Rita Oxanen. She's Deputy Director General at the Department for Development Policy in the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and she is also President of the European Evaluation Society. Before moving forward, I'm going to give you some uh, brief directions on how to use the platform. Uh, as you know, Today, we're having simultaneous translation into Spanish, French, and Russian. So if you want to switch to any of those languages, you have to go to the bottom part of your screen where it says your language, it could say English, uh, Spanish, or Russian. So you just select your option. Also, if you want to interact either with the presenter or with the audience, you can do so uh, in the chat feature on the right part of your screen. Um, we will be having a Q&A session later on, so um, all your questions, you just uh, put them in the chat box and we will compile them and, and go back to them later on. So, how did we get to where we are today? Um, Evil Youth was born in late 2015 in Nepal. Um, in early 2016, Task Force 3 was created. Uh, we are in charge of organizing conferences and learning events for young and emerging evaluators across the globe. And we are very proud to say that in, in December 2016, we held our first virtual conference, which had over 600 uh, participants registered. And after a lot of work this year, um, we are launching this Evolve Youth e-learning series. Today is the first um, webinar but you will hear from us very soon regarding our following um, events. And we are also very pleased to announce that in November 18th, we will be having our second virtual conference, Finding Your Place in the Evolving World of Evaluation. So we hope to see you all there in a few weeks. As for today, we have over 250 participants registered. Um, just as you can see here on the slide, uh, we have people from all the regions of the world uh, registered to take part. Um, the mean age of the participants is 34 years old. Um, the mean years uh, of experience in evaluation are five. 22% of the registered participants are students. And 30, uh, 73%, for 73% of them, evaluation is the main focus of either their studies or their jobs. And 46% uh, of the registered participants are not part of EVOPE. Uh, that means that the majority of them are, but there's still a lot of room uh, for our professional communities to grow. So as for today, well, I first, as you know, I'm giving a brief introduction, then uh, we will move forward to Rita's presentation. Um, after that, I will be moderating a brief Q&A session, as I said before, if you have any questions along the way, just uh, write them on the chat feature and we will go over them um, during the Q&A session. And lastly, Bianca Monroe Moorhead, our uh, task force, um, sorry, Evolve Youth leader, um, will be giving some closing remarks. So um, last, uh, we want to thank uh, all the people who made this possible. Uh, mainly to Rita, who will be giving her, her talk now, to LL Partners, to the Francophone Network of Emerging Evaluators, who were very helpful into um, translating all the promotional material and, and other documents for us for this webinar. Of course, to our Everett Youth Leadership, Bianca, who will you be hearing from later on, Marie and Halid. Uh, the Task Force 3 Leadership, Josette, Antonina and myself, and also to the Task Force 3 members who have been working very hard with us along the way to get where we are now and planning the following activities. So now I we will be giving the floor to Rita. So 
Thank you very much, Rita, and welcome to Evil Youth. Uh, I hope you can hear me uh, clearly. <clears throat> Could you please confirm that you can hear my voice? <clears throat> Thanks, Bianca, and several others. Thank you very much. So uh, the technology is working. I had a few panicky moments because I had problems first logging in, uh, even if we had had a very good test. But but here I am finally. So so thanks very much, uh, Sophia, for for the introduction. Uh, the topic of my talk today is where there is no training, the role of professional training in professional uh, evaluation. Before I go into, uh, into the issues I wish to uh, discuss, uh, let me just say that, that uh, in my evaluation life there will be a big change, or it has actually already happened. I'm uh, changing my day-to-day -day responsibilities at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Um, after seven years in the Development Evaluation Unit, I am, have already moved to uh, the Development Policy uh, Department. And this will mean that my uh, very active contact with the evaluation community uh, will also be, be less because of other, other responsibilities. My term uh, as president of EES is also coming, coming to, a, to an end very, very shortly. And this is why I really appreciate this opportunity to, to talk on this uh, forum. As many of you know, I have had uh, special missions during my EES presidency and my work at the Ministry in Evaluation uh, to support edu um, evaluation capacity development. And there has been a special focus on uh, supporting young and emerging evaluators working with uh, junior professionals in, in evaluation. So it's a huge honor and, and pleasure to me to be able to, to speak with you once again in my, in my current, uh, current role. Uh, also, this provides me with an opportunity to sum up a little bit the thinking that I myself have been developing during these uh, seven years. So this time, uh, I will not make a uh, strictly evidence-based presentation. I will rather uh, share with you my thinking and ideas and thoughts of uh, future and where we should be should be going. So, for once, an evaluator that is not evidence based, uh, making an, an evidence based uh, presentation. Uh, but let's hope that this, this uh, sparks ideas and and uh, we have a fruitful discussion after my my presentation. Uh, there we go. Uh, I will be covering uh, three uh, broad areas during my, my discussion. Uh, firstly, I will uh, discuss the changes in the operating environment of evaluation, and I will specifically focus on what the implications of this uh, is uh, for evaluation capacity. Secondly, I wish to, to put the issue of education and training in evaluation in the more comprehensive framework of evaluation professionalization. And finally, uh, I will uh, conclude and sum up by a discussion on uh, what the role of education and training and what the role of VOPES and here I'm referring to voluntary organizations for uh, professional evaluation, uh, the evaluation societies, associations that, that many of us, not that many of us, but some of us are, are members of, of. I was listening to, to uh, the introduction, and, and uh, there's a lot of potential, potential there. Uh, but anyhow, we will, we will look at uh, the role of education and training and, and the uh, work base in, in this frame, framework that I have, I have presented. So let me start with, uh, with a few words on uh, what is changing in our operating environment. Here I'm building uh, on work that we have done in a small task team at the EES when we have been discussing what the future directions of our society uh, should be. Uh, 
in the bottom of my slide, you have the framework that is very familiar to many of us. That is the, the three bubbles uh, by which we are used to describing evaluation capacity. We need individual capacities, we need ins institutional resources, and we need an enabling environment for evaluation to, to work. This is the framework that you will see in the uh, evaluation uh, agenda for, for medium-term uh, perspective, so that is familiar to you from there. And we always emphasize that, that we need to think about capacities both on demand side, that refers to people who are using evaluation evidence and on the supply side, and that refers to people who are uh, doing evaluations, conducting evaluations and, and producing evaluation evidence. This capacity we use uh, uh, to feed in uh, decision making. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, evidence-based decision making, and to me, I, I sometimes feel that there is too uh, narrow emphasis on, on uh, evidence-based decision-making also. Looking at it from uh, the European uh, side, we are talking about national, EU, global level decision-makings. The element that, to me, we too often uh, forget is that evaluation has another client, if that is what you want to call it. And that is actually uh, the people, the, the taxpayers, beneficiaries of, of uh, development projects and, and, and pro programs, uh, clients of public services, uh, clients of private companies, uh, depending on the, on the context we are talking about. Uh, but uh, for these people, uh, independent evaluation evidence is, is, an, is an excellent means to hold decision makers accountable. Uh, to, to make them uh, take the responsibility that they have when they are using either public or, or private, private funds. So, uh, to me, it's important to highlight uh, these two uh, uh, groups of clients uh, or, or beneficiaries of, of evaluation evidence. Uh, it's important to remember that evaluation is not an end in itself. And I, I wish to highlight this particularly when I'm speaking to evaluator colleagues, because I think that we sometimes really think that it's evaluation that matters. That's not true. The only, the only uh, reason why evaluation is, is important is that it can be used for more sustainable development and, in the end, better lives for all people. And uh, I come from the sustainable development uh, framework. Better lives for all people means also leaving no one behind. So thinking even about, even about the most most easily marginalized uh, people in this in this context. This is a general framework for for uh, evaluation operating environment. Thinking about the past years, uh, there have been several changes that have important implications for, for evaluation. Uh, the first uh, change is that, that our operating environment is uh, evolving and changing more and more rapidly and more and more dramatically. I'm speaking to you from Helsinki. Finland. I'm a Finn by nationality, so uh, a European. And let me ask you to do a small exercise. It doesn't matter where you come from, but, but uh, think about uh, sustainable, sustainable development from a European perspective. So put yourselves in a, in a position of a European. Think about the past two years and think about the five P's of sustainable development. People, prosperity, planet, peace, and partnerships. Can you list a rapid and dramatic change in Europe under these headings easily? I can. It's, it's not a difficult thing to, to uh, think about uh, people for example, the migration situation that we have faced here in, in, Finland, in, in uh, Europe, 
it's not difficult to think when you think about prosperity, about the economic inequalities that are uh, increasing in our continent, or take any of them. Think about partnerships. I can refer to Brexit. I can refer to to uh, the political new situation that we have with with uh, uh, major countries that that traditionally have been our our allies. So very rapid and very dramatic changes that have an influence on on our lives. Uh, secondly, uh, us evaluators often think that evaluation evidence is the, the most important thing in decision making, but we are facing increasing uh, competition. Uh, we are facing uh, competition that is uh, very well uh, justified. Decision makers also use information from monitoring, uh, auditing, research, so on and so forth. Uh, decision makers and people use information from media, increasingly from social media, there are influences from uh, political uh, priorities that influence decision making. What I'm trying to highlight here is that uh, evaluation is but one uh, source of information for decision makers and, and people. And if we don't take the, the uh, increasing competition uh, seriously, uh, I think that evaluation will be in, in problems. Sometimes I say that as evaluators, we have huge egos. Uh, and, and I think that we should learn to, to look at the other sources of information as, as well. Evaluation, unfortunately, is not the most important thing uh, in, this, in this world. So uh, first summary slide of my presentation. When we look at our operating environment, there are major changes. Uh, they are rapid and dramatic, the complexity is increasing, and competition on uh, evidence, evaluation evidence, uh, that competition that evaluation evidence faces is more fierce. The questions here are, how can evaluation in this situation add value? My uh, reply to this question is that, that uh, evaluation can add value because it produces independent information. Uh, this is different compared to many other, uh, many other uh, information sources that are linked to, to special interests. Independence is what makes evaluation special. But I will not focus on that element in this presentation. I will focus on the other one, because the other added value that evaluation can and should bring is that evaluation uh, brings high professional quality compared to many other sources of information. This is what should characterize uh, our uh, profession. And this is what brings the strength to evaluation as well, uh, according to my, uh, my thinking. Uh, let's move on. And I, the second issue I wanted to, to discuss is the comprehensive approach to professionalization. Our topic today is evaluation training, but I think that it's extremely important to look at it uh, in a more comprehensive framework. What I have put up here on the slide now is the IOCE, or International Organization for Cooperation in Evaluation, a global umbrella that brings evaluators uh, together and evaluation uh, societies, uh, associations, the BOPES that I was referring to. And IOCE has been leading work on evaluation professionalization. Uh, and uh, one of the messages, important messages, is that professionalization requires a comprehensive approach. There are several elements that need to be in place uh, for uh, professional work. Uh, we need to have access to quality education and training. Uh, we need to have fora for dissemination of, of knowledge and good practices. Uh, the evaluation conferences are a typical forum for, for this. Evaluation journals, newsletters that we use, social media platforms uh, serve that purpose. It is important to have guiding principles, ethical guidelines and standards as in any other profession, 
uh, think about other professions and, and how they are building on norms and standards to guide the work. Uh, professionalization needs to be built on agreed evaluation capabilities and competencies frameworks. Uh, these are available in a few, uh, in a few cases. Uh, uh, there's been a, a, a strong discussion on what would be the most appropriate means of recognizing the knowledge and skills and dispositions as well as experience. So who could be recognized as an evaluator? And I'm referring to the different credentialing uh, uh, processes, for example, that we have in some parts of the world. And then finally, uh, uh, what is needed are institutional structures for professionalization. And this means uh, uh, evaluation societies, the BOPES that we have been talking about, and also education and training institutions as examples of, of what that, that means. Uh, when we have discussed this uh, framework, comprehensive framework of several elements, this is usually the way that I have been describing it. But I would like to, to uh, set priorities now. Uh, I think that the only sound foundation in a longer term is actually uh, access to quality education and education institutions. That is the foundation that professionalization should be built on. And I'm making a difference here between education. When I use the term education, I refer, refer to basic education at university level. So, so uh, um, uh, university degrees in education. When I refer to training, I'm referring to uh, short courses uh, that are supporting professional uh, development. For example, the, the training opportunities that we often uh, provide during education uh, conferences, they are uh, training, uh, training opportunities. And when I say that the foundation should be built from uh, quality education in education institutions, I am referring to, to uh, university level, level uh, education and, uh, and uh, training. My own conclusion, having looked at uh, the discussion in evaluation now for seven years and uh, having actively participated in that dis discussion as well, is that this is the part that we have overlooked. There is some discussion going on in conferences, in discussions and in the journals on evaluation education, but I don't think it is adequate. Uh, and if we don't uh, succeed in uh, getting more active and uh, moving forward in this arena, we will not have a sound basis for the other uh, elements of professionalization. Uh, so uh, my recommendation, my thinking is that, that this is the only uh, sound foundation that, that we, can, we can have. Uh, as I said, uh, the situation is not, uh, uh, not easy. I, I wanted to say, as I said, I'm, I come from Finland and the situation is, is not easy. Uh, in my own home country, Finland, we do not have uh, opportunities for uh, national opportunities for uh, quality education and education institutions in evaluation. There is not a single uh, evaluation education course in our, our universities. And I know that as Finns, we are not alone. When you look around the world, this is the situation in many, many uh, countries. Uh, second concluding slide. Uh, we need a comprehensive approach to evaluation, uh, professionalization, no single element. Uh, can can do it. So credentialing does not lead to professionalization if the other elements are missing. Uh, but I would argue that uh, more than before, we need to and strongly prioritize access to basic education and training uh, 
uh, institutions. Uh, we are discussing many other things, uh, and, and uh, I think that focus should be more on this element. Uh, how can we achieve this? I think that uh, there is a need to understand basic education in evaluation comprehensively. And uh, secondly, I think that, that uh, there is a need for our own uh, VOPEs to strengthen partnerships for education. There is a lot that we can, we can do. Um, a few ideas of what I mean when I am referring to a comprehensive approach to quality education. Uh, again, uh, we, we do have discussions of these separate elements, but actually for proper education you need a combination, you need a system that, that uh, combines these elements. First of all, you need a uh, curriculum or a, a syllabus if we are talking about training, but for, for an education you need a curriculum that includes the elements that, that, that need to be uh, learned. Uh, knowledge, practice related and attitude related. We need capable evaluation teachers. I'm wondering how many of the teachers who are training and educating in evaluation are actually pedagogically competent. Uh, as I said, this is not an evidence-based discussion, so I don't know, but I'm wondering whether anybody actually knows, knows this. The third element, uh, training uh, materials. Uh, to support curriculum implementation by teachers, we need uh, up-to-date training, training uh, materials. Uh, we need facilities for education and training. That is uh, classrooms, and when I say classrooms in a modern world, that does not only mean physical uh, facilities, but uh, naturally also the virtual opportunities that are plenty, plenty now. We need uh, proper management uh, in, a, in an uh, education uh, program and institution for things to function. And uh, referring back to my, my uh, discussion on the rapidity of changes, these elements that I have listed previously, they cannot stay the same. There needs to be a structured uh, consultation uh, and partnerships with stakeholders continuously to update all these elements, curriculum, teachers, materials, the facilities that we are using and the management management uh, practice, practices. Uh, like I said, I'm missing discussion on these elements. In many other areas of evaluation, we compare uh, experiences from, from uh, different countries. But do we do that enough for, for evaluation uh, education? Uh, do we have proper com comparisons of what curricula uh, contains, what types of materials are used in, in training around the world. So when I refer to a comprehensive uh, framework for education and when I'm uh, requiring, uh, looking for a serious discussion on evaluation uh, education, uh, these are the elements that I am uh, referring to a detailed, in-depth discussion on these, these elements. Uh, I think there is, a, there is a clear role for our uh, uh, VOPEs, the evaluation societies and associations, uh, both at national level but also at regional and, and global, global level uh, in supporting promotion of uh, comprehensive evaluation, education. Uh, the new, new priorities, they are not new in every country, I must say this, there are good, good uh, ex exceptions, but, but looking at it uh, broadly, I think if for many cases these would be new priorities. Uh, the uh, simple thing to do at national level, it's simple but it does not uh, happen too often, 
uh, is is uh, to contact uh, education in, uh, institutions and, and ministries of, of education. When we evaluators contact people outside of our own uh, circles, uh, we most often, if we are in the public sector, it will be ministries that are responsible for, uh, for evaluation, such as ministries of finance or prime minister's office, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, let's do the same for education institutions and ministries, uh, uh, ministries of, of education, because those are uh, the owners of uh, education uh, programs and, and institutions. So let's open the discussion on importance of, of evaluation um, education. At regional and global level, we have several umbrella organizations that can, can bring us together and support uh, development in evaluation in, in any area that we find important. Uh, it would be great to map and ma make available existing resources, and I'm referring back to my, my uh, framework on the elements that are in important. It would be great to uh, promote virtual platforms. Uh, there is huge uh, potential in using the vir virtual means, and that is happening now already, uh, but we could do more. It's mainly happening when it comes to, to training. There are some exceptions and, and examples of education as well, but I see a lot of potential there. And then at regional and global level, uh, in an in e equal world uh, where many countries do not have their own uh, education opportunities, uh, we should try to mobilize resources for, for this uh, together. Uh, I'm finally coming to the topic of my, uh, my presentation. Let me see. I have, here we go. Yes, uh, role of training. Uh, I titled the presentation uh, saying uh, with, with, with the title, where there is no, no uh, training. But actually, with my definition of education and training, education for basic university level education and training for uh, short term uh, professional development uh, training courses and, and opportunities, uh, I must say that uh, evaluation training, and we have a lot of evaluation training, is a substitute to where there is no education. Uh, uh, we try to build capacity as highly qualified and professional uh, evaluators through short courses. Uh, and and uh, as I say, it can only be a substitute. We do need the foundation of uh, proper long-term evaluation education. Uh, but training still has an important role. As long as there is no education, where there is no education, the training opportunities are the only thing that, that we have available, and they are uh, used a lot. We all know that from, from uh, trainings we have, we have participated. Uh, but there is another important role for, for uh, training, uh, an evaluator, never mind whether that is a person who uh, uh, does evaluate evaluations or it is a person like I have been for seven years who commissions evaluations and, and is on the, on the demand side. Uh, there is a huge need to constantly update uh, and uh, keep up with developments around the world. So uh, evaluation training has an important role in continuous uh, professional development in the rapidly uh, evolving operating environment. Uh, the role of uh, VOPES, our societies, is to offer the substitutes for education where education does, does not exist. So where there is no education, there is an important role for VOPES. Offering training, offering, offering conferences, offering mentoring, offering credentialing, or uh, what we have been testing at the EES, the voluntary evaluator peer review system, journals, newsletters, and more. And uh, 
while I, while I say that, that this is a substitute to make my point of strong uh, promotion of basic education, uh, I'm not uh, belittling these things. They are the elements, they are the resources whereby uh, so many of us have been able uh, to uh, build uh, a profession, uh, a career uh, in evaluation. So they are very important, but they are not enough. And I think that with these uh, slides and these uh, ideas, I'm coming uh, to the end of my uh, presentation. And I hope that, that uh, this has uh, inspired you to some uh, ideas and thinking and, and, and feedback uh, to me. I would be very happy to, uh, to discuss and hear your, your uh, comments, ideas, uh, criticism of my, my thinking. So uh, over to, is it Sophia who will continue? Let's see if I can manage. I will now, yes. Hi Rita, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Just to check again, can everyone hear me? Thank you. Okay, um, we have um, a few questions and comments. I'm going to go over them now. Um, the first one by Douglas is, um, sorry, I got lost. Um, evaluation is a stepping stone. Sorry, it's moving. Just give me a second. I'm going to start by Fasila's comments. Uh, in order to promote quality education, should BOPES be getting insti education institutions such as universities or technical institutes and training institutions to have their curriculum reviewed according to quality standards? Uh, and also, how does this uh, happen? Is this difficult because these are independent institu institutions? Then, uh, Safia Du has asked, in what extent do, you, do education institutions contribute to develop professional training even in evaluation and how to be involved with them? Um, also, Antonina is asking a very interesting question. Uh, how can education in related disciplines help in evaluation education? Mm. Anthony Orango is also asking, uh, on the point of journals and other materials, I would like to know where we as young evaluators can subscribe and get those materials. Uh, and then the first comment was by Douglas, who said that innovation education is a stepping stone towards sustainability. Many people, for instance, uh, in Zimbabwe refer to them as evaluators, but they do not have an in-depth understanding of it. Most of them uh, did a six-month certificate. So I guess the question is about um, how to ensure the quality um, of professionals. Imad is asking, I believe Finland, the Finnish embassy has been one of the key supporters of our partners and BOPES. I would like to ask to what extent the fin Finnish embassy support are open to BOPES in post-conflict countries, such as Af Afghanistan, for example. Let's see if we have any more questions. Okay, I'm going to be handing the floor back to you, Rita. I will also send you these questions to your private chat so you can have them uh, now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Excellent uh, questions. And I would, um, I, I can see that uh, Bianca is also available online. Bianca, if you have things to, to uh, add, 
I would really appreciate if you if you would do that because uh, uh, you work uh, in an education institution. So so uh, I'll hand the floor uh, to you at some point if you wish. Uh, so so we can uh, you can uh, add to to what what I'm able to to uh, reply. Uh, uh, there was a question on on how you can influence education institutions that are independent in institutions and and uh, do their uh, decisions on on curricula independently so so uh, it is not necessary for them to to listen to messages from from uh, Wopes, uh, for example i think that this um, this issue will uh, very much depend on uh, the context and country you are uh, working in, but um, in many education institutions uh, there are mechanisms whereby curriculum development is based on consultation of uh, the, the uh, stakeholders outside of these, these institutions. So I think that, that it is important to learn about these, uh, these mechanisms. What happens in curriculum development uh, processes? What happens when curricula for uh, teachers are uh, developed? How can you, you get access to, to those processes? If there are no consultations, then, uh, then the issue is that of, of uh, the typical influencing uh, task that we have in the WOPEs then uh, it is important to find the contacts in the responsible ministries. And as I said, uh, this is often uh, not the ministries that we as, as VOPES usually deal with. Uh, in most cases, it is um, education ministries and educational institutions. So it's learning to understand how the institutions work and uh, how we can uh, gain access to the, to the processes of, of um, developing curricula, developing teacher training uh, programs. Uh, uh, I have uh, some experience from uh, here from, from uh, Finland and uh, the influencing opportunities have been gained through contacts to, to the Ministry uh, of Education in, in our case. So, so these are the, the mechanisms. Uh, Uh, there was a specific question about uh, Finland's uh, support to, uh, to evaluation. Finland has been an active uh, supporter of uh, uh, EVAL partners for several years, and uh, the support has been directly directed to the global program. We, as, as a donor, have not uh, earmarked support to, to any specific uh, Vope or any specific country like Afghanistan that was uh, referred to. Uh, our uh, approach has been that we have provided core funding to the program and uh, based on that and based on the, the criteria and processes that have been established in the system, uh, the funding and support has been, uh, has been uh, then uh, shared to national or regional or, or consortia of, of Vope. So that has, been, that has been the case. Our embassies have some uh, small funding that may also be used uh, to support Vopes, but, but uh, our main support has, been, has, has gone uh, through uh, EVAL partners. Uh, now I should actually check the, let's see if I can, if I can find the it's the first time I'm using this system, so I'll try to find my... Just one sec, I am trying to manage the system in a good way. Uh, I'm wondering, Bianca, if you have anything to add to the... to the comments I have made.
All right. Um, can you just let me know if you see me and hear me? Great. Um, so, uh, Rita, yeah, so I, I actually thought, um, you know, your comment was right on point about um, trying to influence um, uh, institutions in order to promote quality education um, because I, I do um, think um, that it looks different depending upon um, the region or the country that you're in. Um, and I am, as Rita mentioned, someone that is in an institution that trains um, future evaluators. Um, and we have both, uh, according to Rita's definition, a formal um, education option as well as uh, training opportunities because we also um, uh, offer a certificate um, for those who can't come and study with us. Uh, and I know that there are many institutions in the United States um, who do that. So. Uh, one, one of the things, and so let me give you, I guess, a, a counterexample of how different this might look. Actually, two counterexamples. Um, so in the, in the United States, um, the, um, we have not a ministry of education. We have a department of education. Um, and they are in charge of setting policies and funding research, um, but they do not do anything to oversee the quality of the education that is provided. And so, um, so um, you know, that is left up to each um, individual institution. And um, so, um, you know, I think in the United States, this is where Rita's point um, uh, of, you know, the role of VOPES in all of this is well taken. So I do see a role, at least in the United States, for our VOPE, the American Evaluation Association, to think about how they might um, take on that role. And I think um, our neighbors to the north are one potential example of what that might look like. So this is the second um, option of what it might look like. So I'll just briefly mention um, that in Canada, they have formed um, a consortium of institutions that provide formal training and evaluation. And that consortium is um, trying to do just that. Um, they're trying to think about how they can assure some um, quality. Um, across uh, the different uh, institutions and the training that's provided in um, evaluation. So I'll stop there uh, and uh, see if Rita has any other questions that she'd like to answer. Very much. Uh, I actually think that um, it would be great to, to collect the types of uh, examples that Bianca you are uh, referring to, like the Canadian, Canadian uh, example. And if I'm not completely uh, mistaken, I think that there is a network for education evaluators in, in uh, uh, somewhere in the East, but I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar with these, uh, these uh, networks. But as in many other uh, issues, I think that the first step to start collect, collecting uh, existing experiences of, of uh, where uh, institutions are working together or where institutions have been able to, to influence and contribute to the development of, of evaluation. Uh, collecting those, mapping those ex, uh, experiences and collecting those experiences and, and uh, uh, trying to derive good practice good practice from based on those experiences would, would be one, one uh, really good thing, thing uh, to do. Uh, there was a question on how to get access to, to uh, journals and, um, and uh, newsletters. I think that uh, for, for uh, young and emerging evaluators because, uh, because that is one excellent source of, of information. Uh, many evaluation uh, associations and societies, or, or WOPES as we call them, uh, as a service to members who pay the membership fee, 
uh, they they offer access to uh, to uh, journals. In addition to that, uh, many of the WOPES on their websites have uh, newsletters that are the journals are uh, most of them I think are peer-reviewed academic uh, journals, but many WOPES also produce. Uh, uh, newsletters with shorter articles and, and not so scientific articles. So it, it's uh, worth visiting the website of different websites of different WOPEs uh, to to uh, see what is what is available there. Um, all uh, global all WOPEs uh, that are working in the world, uh, you can find uh, a map of them on the IOCE. Uh, website, so that's that's a good route to uh, to finding where the WOPEs are and through their access to journals and newsletters. Uh, Sophia, are there other questions that you would like me to address? Hi, Rita. Sorry, my computer wasn't responding as quickly as it should have. Um, I think um, you and Bianca went over um, all the questions and, and comments. So, um, again, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I'm going to give the floor now um, to Bianca um, for her closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just want to confirm again um, that everyone can hear me. Great. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. I see Sophia and a couple of others um, have said that they can. So, um, so thank you, Rita. I think um, this talk was both um, inspiring and I know how passionate you are about this. Um, it was also, I think, really thought-provoking um, about, um, you know, within this big framework that you laid out um, that I think um, I, I've seen you talk about this before, and I, and I think it's a, a really great way to think about it, um, you know, where we might um, need to uh, make sure that we're paying attention, um, because uh, I agree with you. I think... Um, making sure that we have, um, that there is access um, and equitable access across the globe in terms of, um, uh, you know, ideally formal training, uh, but in the absence of that, um, or I should say formal education, which is uh, how, you, how you framed it, uh, but in the absence of formal education, um, opportunities for uh, training. So the short courses, um, you know, things like that that you mentioned. Um, so um, I really, um, I wanted to um, thank you for, for thinking about that. Um, and um, one of the things that um, always comes up for me when we have conversations about professionalization, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out as my own thought-provoking question. Um, so... Um, we, uh, so I am, I now full disclosure, I am of the belief uh, that evaluation um, is a profession. Um, and whether we're a full profession or a fledgling profession or all of that kind of stuff, I'll, I'll let others debate. But um, I think, um, but one of the things that I also recognize is that we're not the only profession that's out there. So other types of um, professions um, are things like medicine, um, law, um, also um, teaching or teacher education. 
And um, when you read outside of evaluation, which I uh, recommend you do, because I think um, it's helpful for thinking about evaluation in this. Um, but when you read those literatures and you read around the conversations that they've had around professionalization and why they um, prioritized different aspects of that framework that you put up, um, one or another and the steps that they made, um, I'm wondering if there are useful lessons for us um, as um, in evaluation for how to um, be smart about continuing to push forward um, on professionalizing the field and also let us know about potential roadblocks or um, barriers or road bumps that we might hit. Um, so that we can think about, you know, do those things, might those be barriers to professionalization and evaluation, and how might we learn from their lessons um, to try to make sure that they don't become permanent roadblocks or, uh, or barriers that really slow down progress. And so, um, so my thought-provoking question, it, uh, my first one is, you know, what might we learn from others who have traveled this path to professionalization before us? Um, because um, there, I, I suspect there's some really useful information there um, about how you do that. Um, the second thing um, I'll say is, and, and come back to, is um, I think your point, and one of the points that you started with at the beginning, was so important and the idea of who the ultimate um, clients are and what the goal of evaluation is. And part of it is this accountability mechanism, but the other part of it is about making our world a better place and making sure that that happens for everyone and, and letting go of maybe ideas um, that we might, we might have. So, you know, if I'm in a context that is not necessarily uh, designated as a development context, do I need to worry about sustainable development? And I think, Rita, your talk clearly has shown us that, yes, we need to worry about it. Uh, think about the five P's, as you, um, as you put it. And so it's, it's something we all need to work on. Uh, it's a big issue for all of us. And um, in addition to leaving no one left behind, I think um, the other thing to remember is that we, I think we are also stronger when we work together and we collaborate and we support one another than um, if, we're, if we're fragmented and we don't step outside of our boundaries and um, outside of our, uh, the usual things that we do. So with that, let me um, move it forward. Um, so, sorry, those were my closing remarks. Uh, we do have an important opportunity coming uh, forward uh, this week. So, um, please, if you haven't registered, make sure that you register um, for these. Um, also, um, uh, if you'd like to join our efforts, we're always looking for volunteers. Uh, please send us an email, um, evaluate at gmail.com. And save the date, please, um, for our virtual conference. Um, it will take place on November 18th, 2017. And um, you can um, read more about that conference at um, the website that is here. And so with that, let me just say uh, thank you again to Rita for your inspiring and thoughtful talk. Thank you to Eval Youth members who made this e-learning a reality. And thank you to those of you who attended. Um, we hope that you uh, feel that this has been worth your time. I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Bye. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Rita. Thank you to all our audience. Uh, please remember that this will be um, a recording of this webinar will be made available in the following days. Uh, and will be distributed through our social media. So keep in touch and hope to see you soon in our uh, next webinars and the virtual conference. Have a nice day.